Thank you. So show of hands, how many of you think that developing user interfaces is actually easy? All right, so no one's hands got up, right, maybe one or two. But the truth is, we all know that developing user interfaces is not easy. In fact, it's pretty difficult. And you know, working at Microsoft, I completely understand this. <laughs> <laughs> developing user interfaces is a lot more complex than we give it credit for, especially as a, you know, if you talk to back-end engineers, they might think of the front end as just something that, oh, we'll just, you know, throw some CSS on there, which you know makes problems worse. But developing user interfaces comes with a lot of problems on their own, and these could usually be traced down to the behavior of app state and app actions. Even for simple apps where you have two states, downloading or paused, and of course, you know, that doesn't exactly work. And sometimes we just assume that the user is going to follow our directions exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of a two-sided problem. First, we trust the user, and the user trusts us, right? We, we, we think that the user is going to take the easiest way and the most happy pathway through our path, or through our app. But that's usually never the case. And so today I want to talk to you about an idea that's an extremely important idea because it's been around for a long time. It's not an original idea, and it's used in so many different applications, such as software, embedded hardware, electronics, things that keep you alive, even. And it's called deterministic finite automata, or finite state machines. So I ran a poll a while ago, and I asked how many people are actually familiar with finite state machines or use them in design and development. Uh, most of you said no. Uh, some of you were familiar with it, and a very small percentage of you actually use it in code, which is pretty awesome because um, many years ago, we actually, or not we, because I was dead. Well, I was not born yet, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> We, um, software developers use state machines in order to develop applications, and uh, this concept can be extended to user interfaces as well. So I want to explain in very easy terms what a finite state machine is. And so if you go on Wikipedia, you're going to see this definition of the mathematical model of a deterministic finite state machine. My favorite part is this, it explains that a finite state machine is a quintuple. And all right, if you're trying to teach someone something, never start with, it's a quintuple. You know, we're <laughs> gonna be completely lost, have no idea what you're talking about. So finite state machines fall into the automata theory um, category, which is related to combinatorial logic and also has relations to category theory. This could make the concept seem really, really foreign to a lot of people and also extremely difficult. Now, the beauty of React, since this is a React conference, is it makes us rethink. We rethink about best practices, we rethink about just the way we think about developing software, where everything's componentized, everything's hierarchical, data flows in a single direction, and uh, it makes it easier to reason about data. So I, I want to do a little thought experiment with you. Let's say that we wanted to create a really, really simple app. Um, let's say that we wanted to create a button that's just, you know, fetch a goat. It fetches an image of a goat, right? It calls Flickr or something, and um, eventually you get an image of a goat, right? That's all your app does. You're probably thinking right now, like, yeah, that's actually pretty simple to implement. You know, I could think immediately how I want to do this. First, we're using um, component state, because we're not going to get fancy and use Redux quite yet. Uh, we're also you know, going to have an events handler that fetches the goat. So once we get the goat, we put it in state. And then our render function is just going to show the goat. Pretty simple, right? Here's the problem. What if a number of things happen? What if the goat search fails, right? What if we get an error from the server? What if uh, the user decides that he or she really wants a goat and clicks the button repeatedly, like, just give me the goat? And uh, so what's going to end up happening is you're going to have the photo of the goat and then another goat loaded and another goat because, you know, it's a race condition. So what you could do is disable the button, 
But then that's a problem too because the user could just say, oh, I'll just undisable the button. You know, it's really easy to get around apps that way. Also, what if we want a custom loading message or a custom error message? <laughs> we have a little bit of work to do now. So now in our state, let's, uh, and this is a typical way we think, right? Let's add some Boolean flags, right? Let's say, um, we'll, we'll keep track if there's an error, and we'll keep track if we're in the middle of searching for a goat. Also, in our event handler, let's make sure that if we're searching for a goat, let's not try to get another goat, right? And let's also indicate if the search fails that there's a goat error and display an error message accordingly. So on that button, we'll say, hey, the goat failed to load, so do you want to retry? <laughs> our code now got a lot bigger. So before, it was like this. Don't try to read it, by the way. I'm just showing the size. And now we have this. Yeah, well, it's odd shit. You can't really see the shit because it's on the back, background. But <laughs> this is called the bottom-up approach to software development. <laughs> and this is what most of us have either done or are still doing today. And there's a reason for this. It's because it's simple and it works. But there's problems with this. In a bottom-up approach, our event handlers, so for example, when we click a button and we try to you know, fetch the goat, we have so many possible things that could happen in that event because of the business logic involved. So now our business logic, logic is decentralized and it's present in so many different event handlers and it's all over our code. This makes it really difficult to understand exactly what's happening to our code. And this means our code's gonna contain bugs and adding features is going to be an absolute nightmare. Have you ever tried to add a feature to a legacy app or an existing app that you worked on? Where, you know, if it's a week old, it is a legacy app. <laughs> Doing that makes it just extremely difficult because you have to remember which parts of the code that, you know, that you have to touch and that whatever state you're modifying is touching. And this also makes it really difficult to test as well. Water break. Now with React, React has a very simple and a uh, very performant data flow model where since components are nested uh, from their parents, we have props and we have set state. This sort of, and you know, I mean no criticism to React, but this sort of exacerbates our problem with how we develop applications. And the reason for this is because as soon as we need to go to you know, a different state that, um, or sorry, a different component that's not part of the tree, now we have just a flurry of different options that we have to choose from. And so this, thing, this makes things a lot more complicated. And I know some of you are going to go to me and say, well, well actually, David, you could, you could probably, you know, just use props and set state for this too. Maybe use a callback prop. Like, I know I could do this. I could also drive from Florida to Utah, but I decided to take a flight because it was a lot simpler, it's more direct. You know, we like going from point A to point B in the shortest path possible. So the main takeaway from that is this. It's that user interfaces are graphs. They're, you know, they're not strictly trees, they're graphs, which means that things can connect to other things in a non-hierarchical fashion. And I know some of you might also come to me and say, well, actually, my, my application is a tree and data flows perfectly down. I'm still right because trees are graphs too. So don't <laughs> at me. <laughs> so keep that in mind as we go through um, what deterministic finite automata really is. And we're gonna be using probably the simplest example, which is a traffic light uh, to explain what this is. So let's break down all of these three confusing words. First of all, finite refers to the number of possible states we have in our application. In a traffic light, we have three, green, yellow, red, right? Then we have automata, which is just a fancy word for a predetermined sequence, something that's built in, something that mechanically will always happen in a single way. For example, green will always go to yellow, yellow will always go to red, and red will always go to green. Because, you know, if green goes directly to red, people die. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And deterministic finite automata are also deterministic. And what this means is that 
Given the current state in an action, you will know what the next state is going to be all the time. So when the timer goes off, it will go from green to yellow, and then yellow to red, and then red to green, and we could predict this to happen every single time. In Utah, these timers are like 20 minutes each or something. <laughs> so we, we could also consider this a finite state machine. These two things are the same thing. So if, um, if you've heard finite state machines, this is exactly what we're talking about, just to make things a little less confusing. All right, so now let's talk about designing state machines. And fair warning, there's a little bit of graph theory in here. And um, yeah, so let's take Pac-Man, for example. In Pac-Man, we have the ghost, which could only exist in one of three states. First, as a normal ghost that's chasing Pac-Man, or Mrs. Pac-Man. Then, as a ghost that, you know, once Pac-Man eats a cherry, uh, it runs away. And then, um, if the ghost is eaten, then, you know, the ghost becomes dead, or what, well, ghosts are already dead. I don't know, it becomes eyeballs. <laughs> okay, so, in a graph, remembering, you know, your like what a graph is, we have three nodes or states. These are the finite number of states that we represent. In a finite state machine, we always have an initial state, which in this case is just a normal ghost. We have the edges between the nodes, which are the transitions between the states. Now these have arrows, which makes this a directed graph. Why? Because we're going from one direction to another. And then we have actions that cause these transitions, just like I talked about. Once Pac-Man gets a pill, did I say cherry? I'm sorry, I meant pill. Uh, then it becomes, you know, a scared ghost. You eat, revive, or the ghost could go back to a normal ghost, or yeah, the scared ghost could go back to a normal ghost once the timer goes off. So let's go back to our original example. Before we do anything else, we could use two powerful tools that require no code. It's just pencil and paper. I say pencil instead of pen because you will make mistakes. I make mistakes. And with pencil and paper, you could draw this out as a state transition diagram. So considering our original example, first we're in an idle state, right? We're waiting for something to happen from the user, and the only thing the user could do is click. Once that happens, we go into a loading state. And then this fetch could either resolve or reject. And so when that happens, we go to one of two states, either goat or error state. And then once we do a click action again, we go back to loading, all right? When you, um, well, when I was reading about these state transition diagrams, they're commonly referred to as STDs, but honestly, just call it state transition diagrams. <laughs> now, you might find this sort of notation vaguely familiar, and that's because designers inherently work with state machines all the time. It's sort of a natural way of thinking. Uh, they might call it like user flowcharts or something like that, where a user can go from one state to another of the app, and they would design each state of the app. So this is a par powerful application of state machines because they provide a common language for both designers and developers alike. And I don't need to tell you how powerful that is. So now that we've designed our state machine, let's talk about how we develop them. Uh, if you were to look you know, at computer science books or whatever and read up on how do you declaratively represent a graph, then you're gonna see an adjacency list, which is just a mapping of states to states that they're connected to. Unfortunately, this doesn't give us all the information that we need because you know, we need to know what actions have occurred. So what I propose is this. It's a, uh, a machine can be represented as a mapping of states, such as idle, loading, goat, or error, and then each one of those states could be represented as a mapping of actions to the next states. And so if you thought that these finite state machines were difficult to implement, here's the transition function. It's just a lookup function where we look up the current state and then we look up the action that has been performed upon that state. And so if you wanted this magical finite state machine library, here you go, 24 bytes, you know? I don't even need to put it on NPM or anything, you could just memorize it. If you gzip it, it becomes 44 bytes, so don't gzip it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about how we could put this back in our um, application. 
Let's refactor it a little. So now uh, in, our set, in our state, our component state, we're gonna represent the state as two things. We have the finite state, and then we have whatever data we get. And then we're gonna have this thing called commands. And these commands you could think of as side effects. And I borrowed this from Elm because um, Elm's architecture has a very powerful uh, way of abstracting these side effects in a declarative pure way. And that's when you update, instead of just saying, here's the next component I'm gonna render, you say, here's the next component, and here's the command that I also want to run once you render that component. So our transition method in our state is going to do the exact same thing that that transition function that we showed did. It's also going to grab the next command, and then you know, if you were at the last talk, you could see that you could pass a callback to set state, and this is a very powerful way to, um, to execute side effects right from the comfort of set state. And so I know you could use Redux for this, you could use MobX, RxJS, whatever, but there's, there's this natural beauty of just using set state, especially in React, and I'm sure Ryan Florence would approve, which is why I named this pattern Ryan Florence and the State Machine. <laughs> <laughs> now, in our event handler, um, it becomes extremely simple. Why? Because when we get a goat, we just send off a resolve action. And when we, um, when we get an error, we just send off a reject action. The beautiful part of this, compared to our last thing, is that no matter how many other states we use, no matter how complex our application gets, this is never going to change. It's never going to grow. And that's the important part. And because of that, we could actually grab that state instead of random Boolean flags, and we could declaratively render our view. And I'm just using a, you know, a map or a uh, object, whatever you want to call it. Um, I know that sometimes you use switch, but honestly, I like representing things as you know, just objects. So now, let's talk about testing and visualizing our state machines, because this is another powerful application of it. Oh, shoot. Hold on. It's resolving host. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Come on. You know what? I prepared it here. So, Because we could represent our state machine as a JSON object, instead of switch statements or if statements or Boolean flags or anything like that, I could do some really cool things like, um, like representing it as a, a visual graph. So, you know, I could change this, and, well, I guess it doesn't change. But anyway, I promise you it works. I just have a few bugs to fix. Uh, this is something called Cytoscape, um, and I, I tried to use D3, but D3 doesn't really handle nested graphs and things like that. But the idea is that by having a declarative representation of your finite state machine, there's a lot of applications that you could do, there it is, that you could do from it. And also, testing is more powerful, too, because of this. Why? Because, um, you know, when you're using Storybook or you're using just snapshots, you want to do two things. First, you want to get all of your states. All that is is object.keys, right, on your, you know, on your object. And then, you know, finding all of the transitions, that's just iterating through each of the states. And then you could go crazy and use Dijkstra or Breath First Search or any of those other crazy algorithms that you've only used for interview questions. And you could actually use that to find the shortest path between the initial state and every other state. And that way you could automate unit testing and uh, integration testing. Now, it would, it would not be right for me to, um, to talk about all the benefits of finite state machines without talking about some of their trade-offs, too. Uh, one of the most obvious trade-offs is that um, Let's go back to our traffic light example. Let's say that we have a, you know, a simple traffic light that goes from green to yellow to red. And now let's say our boss comes in and says, hey, you know how we live in Florida? We have hurricanes, we have um, power outages because of thunderstorms. Uh, you know, sometimes Florida man crawls on the power poles and <laughs> takes it down. So we need this flashing red state whenever the power goes out. All I did was add one state and you see what happened? Now we have three more transitions. 
So imagine if we had even more states. We had to add even more transitions, and this is what's known as state explosion. Uh, I, I was um, creating this slide at the airport. That was not a good idea. <laughs> anyway, there's this thing called state charts that solves this. And what state charts are, are hierarchical finite state machines, and they were invented by a guy named David Harrell, so they're also known as Harrell state charts. And again, this was in 1987, so it's a very, very old concept that's definitely useful today. There's three main benefits of state charts. The first one is that you could represent your finite state machines as hierarchical states. So now instead of saying, um, you know, we have all these states interconnected, let's imagine this as two states, both the normal operation of the traffic light and the flashing red thing. And so now we could just say, when normal has a power outage, go to flashing red. And so there's two rules with hierarchical states. The first one is, when you enter a state, you also enter all the initial substates. So when you enter normal, you're actually in normal green. And then things progress as normal, normal green, normal yellow, normal red. And then when the inner machine cannot handle an action, such as a power outage, it sends it up to the parents and asks for help, sort of like, like talking to God or something. And then it would take that normal, um, and normal would say, hey, I know how to handle this and then it would just transition to flashing red. So this simplifies things a lot because we could put as many states as we want inside normal, and the number of transitions out going to flashing red will never change. There's also the concept of concurrent states, which is that a state machine could be in more than one state at the same time. The most obvious example of this is a text editor where you could have bold, underline, italics, right? Each of these could be on and off, and each of these could, you know, have basically their own state machine, right? And I know what you're thinking, like, you know, I thought we were being deterministic. I thought we could only be in one state at a time. What is this? Is it like, you know, Schrodinger's state machine where we don't know if our app's alive or dead? But the reason this works is because each of the state machines are orthogonal, which is just a fancy word that means they don't touch. And uh, one of my favorite features is history states too. Imagine you had a payment flow where the user is entering a payment method of either a card or a check, and then the user goes to a review page and then goes back. We want to remember if the user chose card or check, and that's what history states are good for. So I actually wrote a library for this called xState um, because all the other state names were taken, so I just put an x in front. But it actually makes sense because X stands for a transition or between states or something. And so this tiny library handles um, transitioning from both hierarchical states and concurrent states in ways that you would expect. So just like that state machine before, um, if we are in bold off and we toggle bold, we're going to be in four states at the same time. Bold on, italics off, underline off, and list bullets. And the best part is it's represented also as a JSON object. Um, we just had to extend our original syntax a little bit so that we could have both states, which are the nested states, and on, which is the mapping of actions to other states. Now, there's a lot of advantages to using state charts, such as having precise semantics, um, which allows you to make them declarative, having a rich expressive notation for describing these state charts, and many other things where you could describe complex user interfaces in a completely declarative way. Now, um, the, my, my main inspiration for this and where I got the most information is from this book called Constructing the User Interface with State Charts. It was written in 1997 by Ian Horrocks, and I, I really want to recommend it to you, but if you go on Amazon, it's like $675. So <laughs> maybe hold off or put it as a business expense. I don't know. <laughs> Thankfully, there's other resources for this, including the original paper and two excellent articles by Guillaume Roche and Adam Solove, which don't necessarily talk about state charts exactly, but they definitely point in that direction. And um, as I was walking, I saw this sign, so I thought it was extremely appropriate that even though it's covered in bird shit, it's a very important message. <laughs> and that's that we want to stop maintaining state in, in an unpredictable way. 
And so I, I really encourage you, whether you're using it just for design, just for testing, or if you're going the extra mile and you're using state machines for actual development, that, that you find state machines and thinking of your data as a transition between two different states connected with an action that um, you, know, you start to represent your data in a way that's robust, testable, maintainable, and easier to reason about. So with that said, thank you, React Rally. You can find me everywhere at David K. Piano. Thank you.